Hi, everyone. My name is Crystal, and I would like to thank everyone for coming uh, to our session with Dr. Uh, Balodia and Dr. Chowdhury. Um, they are both implant dentists, and they will be having a session with dental chatterers today, and we are so happy to have them. Um, whenever you guys are ready, you can have the floor. Awesome. Hey, guys. How are you? So my name is Dr. Darshan Velodia. I am an implant dentist, like Crystal said, and I have my friend here with me. How are you guys doing? Darshan, you go to the next slide. I'll start my thing and then we'll go from yeah. there. How do I go to the next slide? Oh. All right. How you guys doing? My name is Dr. Neil. Me and Darsh actually did dental school together um, at Temple. So we're happy to be here. We're happy to you know, share our experience. And we want to make this a thing where, you know, we'll share our story and we really want to be able to open this up, you know, for Q&A uh, shorter rather than later. So you guys can, you know, ask questions. But a little bit about me. I graduated from Penn State University. Uh, I was a bio major. I busted my butt. I was not naturally intelligent. Um, and luckily, after two DAT attempts during my gap year, I got my only dental school admission in the temple. Um, and, you know, dental school, in my opinion, um, it's actually easier or it's harder to get into dental school than to get through dental school. That was my personal experience because in dental school, if you want to be a general practitioner, you don't need to, you know, get 100s on everything, right? You have a little bit more leeway. In undergrad, you kind of had to, bust your butt, every question matters, right? So um, got through dental school, you know, made the best of friends, had a great experience. Um, and then that's when my journey really started. And that's what most dentists will tell you, your journey really starts after you graduate. So after I graduate, after I graduated, I, I went to Mexico and I took my first implant course. And that's when I sort of, um, I got addicted to the surgical side of dentistry. And that's all I wanted to do. Um, and since that point, I mean, me and Darsh have been taking implant course after implant course, going to Guatemala, Nicaragua, Mexico, all these places to learn from the best in the world. Um, and, you know, we've invested a lot of our money into this game. And that's kind of what I tell people, you know, I get a lot of DMs asking how, what I did and, and how to get here. And ultimately you have to pay to play. You have to pay to play in this game. And especially if you're not, you know, going to do a residency or an oral surgery, oral surgery residency or anything like that. So um, I, I've been doing that. Um, I got my real start working for an implant and dentures clinic in Pennsylvania and North Carolina over the last year and a half. And I'm actually moving to Seattle for a full, what we call an all on X clinic, which is, you know, I'll get into that in the next few slides. I'll let Darsh do his thing and I'll explain what that is. Go ahead, Darsh, do your thing. Um, <clears throat> oh, let me oh. go over this real fast. So this is sort of my daily schedule when I was in North Carolina. So my office was open um, five days a week. It was a little bit of a shorter schedule from 7.30 to 3.30 p.m. Um, and the way it was designed was, you know, right when I got in, I, I had consults from 7.30 to 10 a.m. And consults are essentially, you know, first time you see the patient, you you diagnose, you figure out what the patient wants, what the patient needs. And a lot of what I did was same day treatment. So if I saw a patient who wanted treatment that day, I would actually do it that day. And, you know, we had an in-house lab to help facilitate that same day treatment. So those consults were the first three hours of the morning. I then had my surgical cases from 10 to 1 p.m. And the way it worked for me was I had three surgical chairs. Um, I had three patients in each chair at any given time. And I would generally numb patient one, numb patient two, extract teeth on patient one, numb patient three. So I'll pretty much bounce from patient to patient. And, you know, there was so much volume at that office, I really had no choice if I wanted to 
get through the day. So yeah, it was stressful at times, but it definitely, um, when you're put under pressure like that, you have no choice but to build speed. And um, one of the best experiences that, I, that I've had up to date was, was making the leap, moving to a new state where I didn't really know anyone. And I highly recommend, you know, when you're first starting out, don't let geography ever limit you. You know, if you find a good opportunity, you take it. Even if it's for six months to a year, you'll thank yourself for doing it. Um, and that was kind of my, you know, my day overall after surgeries, we, we would deliver the, uh, the immediate dentures or over dentures or fixed dentures, uh, from one to three thirty PM. And, and that was it. Hey guys, like I said, my name is Dr. Darsh. So <clears throat> I became a surgically focused GP or implant dentist, as I like to call it. So started at Temple University, bachelor's in science. Um, and then I was in the three plus four program. So in my situation, I had a little bit more of a path drawn for me. I did after sophomore year, I took my DAT and then applied. And then I think December of junior year, I got in. So then that last semester of junior year, I like did nothing at all. Um, just cruise control and enjoyed and then dental school started and boom yeah there was definitely a big learning curve in dental school um, uh, I thought the first first semester I was like trying so hard to just get good grades and do all this stuff and study and, and outwork myself and then <clears throat> and then the biggest thing I realized in dentistry sorry the biggest thing I realized in dental school is the harder I tried, the worse results I got because the less I, the less I slept. The more I slept, the more prepared I mentally was for the exams. So the biggest thing in dental school, if I have to give you guys advice, make sure you sleep enough hours. I rather sleep two extra hours than sleep like four and be on half fumes going into an exam. So just, um, just some words of wisdom going forward. Um, anyways. Uh, graduated from Temple in 2021. Um, I actually looked up my first implant course while I was in dental school. And, you know, you might be thinking that, oh, you can't do a CE course while you're in dental school. That's actually not true. Uh, there are plenty of dental courses, CE courses that will accommodate you if you're a dental student. And, you know, you, uh, you talk to the um, person in charge of it. Um, and they definitely have things out there for dental students. <clears throat> And so uh, I set that up for our fourth year. Um, so me and Neil and a couple of our other buddies, we, we took that course in dental school. And so then fast forward to September of 2021. So I graduated May 2021 and September 2021, I placed my first implant. Um, and that was because I researched it ahead of time and, you know, got myself set up so that I had the implant training from day one. I didn't want to... I knew I knew how important implants were to dentistry and how, you know, they're becoming more and more popular. So I didn't want not having the training be the excuse that I couldn't place implants. So I sought that out early. Okay, worked for a GPS six months and I hated it. I didn't place any implants. It sucked. Um, you know, but your first job is usually going to suck. You're probably going to be underpaid. You're probably not going to make as much. It's okay. It's a learning experience. Then, you know, like Neil said, we invested a lot of money in our implant continuing education. And, I, you know, I have my list of courses coming up in the next two slides. Um, <clears throat> and then I found an implant denture uh, focused uh, group. And I met them actually at my dental CE course. So another side note, CE courses are amazing for networking. You just never know who you're going to meet. And you just go and talk to them. And, and even if they end up just being the, I don't know, the, the HR department for this company. You don't know what value they could bring you. So just network, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, during, that, uh, during that time in 2020, I was placing about 20 to 50 implants a month, you know, mainly singles over dentures. And then right now I work for an all on X focused practice. So all we do, like majority of our case are all on X. Um, and so that's basically your teeth in a day. Um, these patients are, uh, sedated. They're, you know, basically put to sleep. Um, and so you're working on someone who's, you know, asleep, doing what you need to do. And then you, and then, you know, you do all your scans and stuff, which will, which I'll go into the process Morning a little bit. Um, 
and then we uh, get to uh, making the teeth for them the next day. So right now I'm doing about five arches a month, give or take, which is one upper or one lower. Okay, next slide. So my schedule is um, four days a week, uh, 10 hours each. Very nice, uh, you know, having the Mondays off. I can do things like this. Um, Tuesdays and Wednesday are more, more of our prost and consult days. And Thursday, Friday are surgery and consult days. So prost meaning, you know, delivering the final zirconia teeth, making the temporary printed resin teeth, night guards, um, uncovering previous implants, scanning, bites, photos, photogrammetry, uh, you know, basically doing the whole digital workflow. So it's not analog, <clears throat> it's fully digital. And so, you know, it helps save a lot of time and a lot of appointments, which we'll kind of get into. Um, and then Thursday, Friday, yes, are the surgery days, singles, bridges, all our next, you know, all that good stuff. Now, let's talk about consults a little bit. You know, I'm basically selling someone a Mercedes, right? I'm selling someone a Mercedes. I'm saying, hey, give me $50,000 or whatever it is. And, and you know, trust me to place the implants on you, on you. Why would someone trust me? There is a whole level of psychology and a whole level of just, I hate to use the word sales, but a, a part of sales. There is a part of sale in dentistry. Now, it's not obviously the whole thing, but there is a part of sale in dentistry. And anyone who says otherwise, you know, they're clearly delusional because no one is just willing to pay you $50,000 just like, here you go. It just doesn't happen like that. Um, so in terms of consults, you know, what my, my little tidbit for consults, my advice, my, my, sorry, my goal going into every consult is to make the patient cry. What does that mean? I want to make the patient cry, meaning that I have, I have brought out the emotions in them of why they're there. Oh, I've been missing my teeth for so many years. Oh, I've been, I haven't been able to smile for my friends or family. Oh, I haven't been able to go out and eat dinner with my girlfriend. Whatever the reason is, my goal is to bring that emotion out and remind them why they're there. Because when patients sit in the chair, they're so scared that they're like shaking half the time. And, you know, you're like, oh, hi, uh, how's your day going? Uh, how's your dog doing? You know, no offense, but like they don't really they don't really care whether you know about their friends and family or not. They care that you're understanding their problem. And that's why they're there. And you want to you want to bring the problem to a conversation because, you know, that patient's there for a reason. Now it's your job to find out why so many dentists get focused on like, oh, I can place do this and that, do the veneer here and do the Invisalign here and do this and do that and talk we, the details out of it, you know, to patients. But sometimes just you need to think back and that's a human in front of you and why they're there. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, like I said, these are pretty much all the CE courses I've taken. Um, so, you know, as you can see, it's all geared towards implants. Uh, so basically implant pathways, I started there um, highly recommend them. Uh, sessions one through four, they're, they're didactic plus surgery placement. And then oral conscious, uh, sedation, com implant complications, bone grafting, GBR. Live implant training was all on X training. Care conference was through my old company, just uh, networking with so many implant doctors in the network. Uh, sinus lift and immediate implant placement. Um, then a all on next digital workflow called uh, Atlantic Implant Institute. And then now Orca, like Neil was saying, was um, going to Guatemala and placing more advanced implants from some of the best surgeons. And you guys can see kind of, this is just me, but this is how I keep track of everything. Where I'm going, uh, what, I, well, what the course is, who the teacher is, where, date, did I book my flight, did I book my hotel? Because sometimes, you know, when you're taking courses and trying to stay organized, you need a good way. So who knows? Hopefully this helps someone someday. <clears throat> All right. So next thing is, is yes, those beautiful phones. Pull, pull them out and give, give your boys a follow. So give us a follow. djbelodia1 at gmail.com. Dr. Neil official. Well, not .com. djbelodia1. And then Dr. Neil official. 
So give us a follow. We'd appreciate the love. You know, we're going to share more content with you guys. And, you know, if you have questions, you can always DM us. Anything, Neil? Yo, you're muted. Sorry about that. Guys, you can always DM me. I, I do my best to answer. Um, if I don't, just DM me again. And um, it's probably the best way to, to get in touch with me. So uh, go ahead. I'm yeah. just going to slide and I'll start going over some cases with you guys uh, of what I do. Cool. Thank you, Andy Mendez. And thank you, Emma, for following us. Appreciate y'all. Okay. All right. So and this goes, you know, not only in dentistry, but in life. You're not going to get to the highest level of anything without mentors that are at the highest level, right? The way I think of mentors is, you know, you could find someone good to mentor you, or you could find the best in the world to mentor you. And you may be asking, how do I get in contact with the best in the world? And you figure it out. I mean, I was respectfully annoying, as I like to say. This guy on the right is Simon O. He's probably one of the best best if not the best full art surgeon in the world this guy in the middle um juan gonzalez is another full art legend this guy writes all the textbooks dan holtzclaw um these guys are the best in the world so i've managed to you know get to where i am not because i'm some genius but because i know how to surround myself with the right people and um you know when you love the game you're going to want to be around the best so that's Something that has definitely gotten me to this point, and me and Darsh have, you know, really made that a priority um, as we've navigated this journey together. Uh, go ahead, Darsh. Next slide. So this is my first implant. It's funny to look at now. It's my first implant um, in private practice. This was probably my first month of private practice after I took all those implant courses. So it's a pretty good looking implant, I have to say myself. What do you think, Darsh? Not too bad for my first one. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Go ahead, next slide for me. So yeah, guys, I think uh, I've talked to a few of you via DM, and and a lot of people ask me like, you know, how do you, how do you get to do the full arches? Like, how do you get into the big surgeries? And I tell them, you start with this. You start with baby steps. You start with a baby single implant. And at the time, it was the most stressful thing in the world, right? I say baby now because, you know, I've been doing it for a couple of years, but um, you get really good at bread and butter, single implant placement. And what I, what I find and what I got really, you know, proficient at is taking a tooth out, right? In this, in this picture here, you take a tooth out and you immediately put an implant in. That's called an immediate implant. And if you're able to do that, it's better for the patient, right? The patient can, get, can you know, be in pain one day get the tooth out, get the implant in, and then you let that implant heal for four to six months. It saves the patient time. And, you know, right now you're not thinking about production and, and making money, but from the patient perspective, it's a good thing, right? Here's another example of, you know, a single implant placed. The idea is, you know, you want to be in the middle of the two teeth. I'm, I'm going to dumb it down, right? You don't want to be too close over here, too close over here. You know, you want to envision a crown, right? Whenever I place an implant, I, I envision a crown coming out of the top. And this is where that crown is going to be, right? So I'm moving the mouse and I realize it's not going to show. Is it dark? Because you're controlling I, wait, I'm, Is my mouse moving? Can you it's guys moving. see Yeah, that? I'm moving my own mouse, okay. but it's obviously not going to work. Um, <laughs> and then that's another example, guys, on the right, just another single implant. So I got really good at these before I started going crazy. Um, go ahead, Darsh, next slide. So this is an example of like a full arch treatment, right? So if you look on the left, the, the left, those two pictures on the left, the upper and the lower, they're actually the same case. So that upper picture, you can see that bone, so I'll go ahead and point to that bone on the upper left. So that is what we call a really narrow ridge. That's your, that's your mandible. So um, we have a lot of patients who've been wearing dentures for a long time. And when you wear dentures for a long time, that's the kind of bone you get, you know, it, it resorbs over time. So what we kind of have to do is, is take some of that bone away. And that picture on the bottom is what you get when you take some bone away, you get a little bit of thicker of a ridge, 
where you can you know place those implants. Uh, the picture on the right is is the case where I place six implants up top. That's the maxillary ridge. So a lot of these, you know, you have to. You, you're probably wondering why the hell are you doing this crazy stuff? And most of the time, it's patients who haven't been to the dentist in ten years. You know, these patients are mortified of the dentist. They they neglected their teeth. You know, they haven't picked up a toothbrush uh, in God knows how long, and now they need a solution, right? And this is the this is one of the two solutions, right? Um, you remove the teeth, you place implants, and then you, you know, you attach the, the teeth to these implants. Go ahead, Darsh. Next slide. Here are another couple of cases. So the case on the left, I mean, here's a good example. If you look um, on that left picture, you can see the bottom teeth. I mean, the bottom teeth are all decayed, right? There's not much left. All the molars are gone. Um, all the teeth are pretty much infected. And so the, the top teeth look the same. And so we removed the top teeth. We placed four implants there, as you can see. And in general, you know, the all on four technique it is a technique. It's, and I'm not going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to go on a tangent and talk about all on four and all this and, and get technical, but basically, yeah, Darsh is going to get into, you know, what happens after these implants are placed. Um, Cause obviously patients aren't paying for implants. They're paying for teeth, right? And another example is on the right. This is just a conventional, you know, implant case where I was placing two implants on the left, two implants on the right. Um, patient wanted to, to obviously save his teeth there. They're, they're in pretty decent shape. So that's what we did. Yeah, Darsh. This is just another example. Um, it's an aesthetically pleasing case. That's why I put, you know, posted it. Six implants on the bottom. You can see the picture on the right is um, the implants are there. We screw on a little piece on top of the implant. And, you know, right now I'm kind of checking the angles there, making sure that the teeth will fit on in a passive way. Um, go ahead, Darsh. So Darsh is now going to get into what happens after, you know, the implant placement. Yep. Like Neil said, you know, patients are not paying for implants, they're paying for teeth. So now, you know, no matter how we place our implants, whether they're straight or whether they're sideways, we got to make teeth somehow. No, I'm just kidding. But um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> let, let's take a look at a single anterior case right here. So we take a look at the left side right here. So my friend here, she is missing her number seven right there. It's a little nub. It's a little bit tough to tell. And this is where she ended up. Um, uh, you can't, you know, she had a low smile line, which is great. A lot of times you wanna look at the first thing in implant dentistry you wanna do evaluating every patient is their lips. You wanna see how much of their lip moves when they smile. Like, are they, is it, is it really gummy? Or, or do they have a low lip line where, let's say if you have some metal showing here, it's still not gonna show. Um, that's the main thing in implant dentistry. The transition line, if you don't get that right, patient is not going to be happy and you are not going to be happy. So whenever you're evaluating a case, that's always one of the first things you do. So for this patient, look, the, I place this implant myself, pretty much right equidistance between the teeth. Um, you see a good amount of tissue right here. So a little bit of thick tissue. Whenever it's called keratinized tissue, whenever you're placing implants, you want as much keratinized tissue as you can get. Um, here's another view of that. Uh, and so fast forward, this is called a abutment. So you have the implant, you have the crown, but there's a connecting piece called the abutment. And so the abutment <clears throat> will screw either into the implant or it will be cemented to the crown. So there's two types. So there's a screw, a screwable crown, and there's a cemented crown, even for implants. And so in this case, the 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 implant was just a little bit um, tilted forward, and so a cement crown will help correct some of the tilting. And so we went with an abutment. So I put my abutment on, and you see right here, this is a metal abutment. So if the patient had a low, a high smile line where you could really see everything, some of that metal might show through. So 
because she had a low smile line, metal was okay. And, and she's a little bit older, so she didn't really care as much. If she was like 30 years old, this definitely might not be as acceptable or if she had a higher smile line. So your patient and their, you know, their factors are also important to consider. Um, and, and now <clears throat> let's look at an all on X case. So we placed her implants and we put her in our multi-unit. So what is a multi-unit? So just how I described a, the implant crown and then the abutment, this is the same situation, but for all on X. Implant, teeth, and multi-unit. So multi-unit abutment. So what that does is that helps correct some of our angles. So let's say if this implant was really flaring out too much forward, then I could correct it with the multi-unit. The multi-units come in different degrees. So 0, 17, 45, and so on. And so that can help correct it to get our teeth nice and straight. As you saw in Dr. Neal's case, his, that, that all on four case, two of the implants were tilted. So how do we correct the tilt? The tilt is to, is to, get the, is to maximize our spacing. Okay, we maximize our spacing. How do we correct it? With angled multi-units. And so once we once you place our implants, we do we put our multi-units on next, and, and the tissue will heal around that. As you can see, the tissue healing. This is the lower, this is the same patient upper and lower. And so <clears throat> you can see that you know we placed all of our multi-units strategically so that they are as parallel as possible. So our teeth can go in nice and parallel. Okay, so let's take a look. So this is one of my patients. He basically, you know, you can see how much, you know, just decay, this discoloration, missing all of his upper teeth. This is how he looks when he smiles. He's not confident. And this is where he ends up. Oh my God, something's skipping around. Um, this is where he ends up. Before, after. Now, who would you rather talk to? Unfortunately, it's the same person, same personality, nothing's changed except his teeth. Who would you rather talk to? And, and a lot of these patients, you know, when I'm sitting down with them in the console, you know, I'm looking them in the eye and I'm telling them that, hey, I'm not giving you teeth, I'm giving you confidence. You know, it's not even just teeth, it's confidence. You know, these people now have a chance to smile, to laugh, to, to do things that we take for granted because we're not missing those teeth. And there's so many patients out there um, for whatever reason, drug abuse, uh, cavities, neglect, um, <clears throat> just uh, accident, uh, whatever, maybe even previous treatment, failed treatment, whatever it is, they now have a chance to get the teeth that they need and we can make that for them in a day. So what does it take to make the teeth? So there's, there's, a few, there's, there's a few different workflows to this. The most, what I found to be the most popular nowadays is everyone's moving towards digital. So people talk about digital dentistry all the time. So digital, digital, digital. But what does it actually mean and what does it consist of? It's all the same things of when you're taking a stone model, you pour it up, and now you, you know, make go, now you go with the traditional actual physical model. You actually have a physical model. But in this case, it's all done over the computer digitally. <clears throat> so first thing is our cone beam. You need to know where you're placing the implants. You need to know, you know, to, you need to show the patients too, because patients like to see what's going on with them. And no one, no one's ever showed them this, you know, they're like, wow, that's cool. This doctor is going over my cone beam with me. Um, you can just pull it up on a computer for them and you can plan the implant case in front of them. I plan all, every single implant case in front of them so that they can see. Yeah, granted, it's not the final plan. It needs some fine tuning, but at least they can see. And so, you know, like, let's say this tooth needs to be replaced. Okay, we can put the implant right here in the software so they can see in, in the console room. And so, um, and so that's step one. And from here, from the cone beam, if you want to do it guided, 
if you want to, uh, you know, just prepare yourself for where the nerves are, for where the sinus is, you know, whatever, uh, if you need to do a sinus lift, whatever it is, you can see and visualize everything. If you don't have this, this is step one. If you don't have this, you can't place an implant, in my opinion. Step two, a scanner. So a scanner, basically, now you place your implant, you put a little scanning abutment on the implant, and now you can tell where the position of the implant is. You can scan their tissue as well. So just like here, how, you're, how you have the teeth, you can get the tissue for the implants as well. There's different brands out there, like Trios, Medit, you know, uh, Itera, whatever it is. And it's a very easy process for the most part. Um, your assistants can do most of your scanning. You really don't need to do scanning at all, okay? So we got our implant placement. <clears throat> we got our scans for our tissues, for our implants. Now, the next step is uh, designing. So we need to design the teeth as well. And so how I was talking about um, doing it on a traditional model like this, instead of that, the model is literally on that software right there. You can see, you, you get the records and now you can make the denture or you can make the, the wax up or you can make the, you, if you need to mount the case, you can mount the case. Um, whatever that it is that you need to do partial denture, um, whatever it is that you need to do, this can all be done through uh, the software. It's called Exacad, right here, Exacad. And this is a little bit more advanced um, designing, but at least you, at least you know, it's something to be aware of. Um, there are designers out there. Like, let's say if you don't feel comfortable designing yourself, you can hire someone to design for you, and so now they can design the teeth for you. It's like a lab tech. You know, you just hire a lab tech. Um, to send you a denture, you can hire a designer to send you back teeth. <clears throat> um, now, the biggest thing with, uh, with implant dentistry is, especially with all on X cases, is how do you know it fits? You have five different implants with different angles. How do you know that that thing is going to fit on? What if, one of the what if it doesn't fit on one of the implants? The whole thing isn't going to fit that. So how do you verify that it's gonna fit? It's called photogrammetry. Uh, traditionally, I don't know if, you've ever, if you guys have probably heard of a verification jig before. If you haven't, basically it's to verify that the teeth will sit on properly. If one of the implants is tilted a little bit this way or that way, it might not sit on. And so now with this, it's a digital verification jig that you take the dominoes, you screw it onto your multi-unit. So just imagine a multi-unit underneath here. You screw it onto the multi-unit. And so now you take the machine, it, it lights up green and, and it'll scan all of your implants right here. This is, excuse me, this is on a model, but this is what it'll look like in the chair. The assistants or you can just scan the patient sitting right there. And then now whoever's designing your teeth will know that, hey, this thing fits this thing will fit in a line. It's called alignment. So it will fit and align to the teeth. And so, you know, this is kind of a final design here, but here you can see this as well. And this is iMetric only. There are other photogrammetry brands. There's PIC, there's a uh, Micron Mapper. Um, uh, there's one more, but I can't remember off the top of my head, but those are, there's like four main ones. Okay, next thing is, this I think is the most exciting thing, printing. It is so much fun printing. Um, and and it's, it's just cool that, hey, patient breaks his teeth, or, oh, I bit on a caramel apple, or, oh, I, I, I don't know, I was grinding my teeth, or, oh, I don't know, whatever reason. Uh, if their teeth break, you can print a new one next day. You can be like, hey, just come on over, we'll print you a new one, boom takes like 30, 40 minutes. So there's a few components to printing. So number one is yes, the printer. Okay, you get the software set up. And then this, this right here is called the build plate. So you build on the plate, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, a nice name there. And so you load all your teeth on the build plate and the software will give you a time, how long it's gonna take to print this. And so, you know, it's just gonna print. 
and and it just it basically the build plate just moves up and down up and down up and down and it keeps adding resin so 3d printing is adding milling is subtracting which is the next slide but now basically inside imagine there's uh your resin inside a little tank right here and so this will just it creates a vacuum so printing is just creating a little bit of a vacuum and so now with the vacuum it's able to add layer by layer by layer by layer and so you can see here how these are called supports you can't just have the teeth you can't just have the teeth hook on to the build plate it has to be supported just like this and so the, it builds from the supports to the build plate right here. And so after, you know, whatever you print, after it's done, then you need to <clears throat> clean it, wash it. And that is very important because a lot of times if you don't clean it and wash it, the teeth aren't going to fit on the patient's mouth properly. You have to clean and wash it properly. Um, once you do that, then you cure it. It's just like resin. It's like composite. You want to cure it, make sure it's nice and hard. Um, once you're done cleaning it and then you can go ahead and paint the teeth. So um, in terms of painting the teeth, there's kind of a whole set of paints. It's just like a, it's just kind of like arts and crafts. You just have the different colors um, and, and you just paint it on with a paintbrush uh, and then you glaze it up and cure it. So it's, it's a relatively easy process. Um, now, the next step is milling. So, you know, <clears throat> whenever you're sending out a case to a lab and you're asking for a zirconia crown, they're gonna mill it. But now in this case, you can do milling in-house as well. You can just get a machine like this and mill it in-house. The reason why, number one is cost effective. Because if you're sending out a case, it, it could be, lab could charge you two, $3,000 per case versus you could, you could just get this puck right here for a few hundred dollars and mill it in-house. Um, number two, uh, turnaround time, you know, labs, they have their own schedule. That's not like, oh, Dr. Darsh's teeth broke. Now I need to send it to him tomorrow. They, they don't care. Like they, not, they do care, but they have a schedule. And so when I can just mill something in-house, um, and, and do it on my own schedule, that, that, that's a practice builder. You know, patients love you and they're like, Hey, my daughter's wedding is coming next week. Uh, and my teeth broke. What do I do? I'm like, oh, no, don't worry, Miss Jones. I got you come through. And so, you know, those are the little things that digital dentistry can do. Practice, uh, practice builder, uh, patient experience, um, efficiency, I don't have to rely on someone else. Because imagine, imagine if you needed to rely on someone else for everything, you know, obviously labs are there, but if you can keep everything in house and do it, these are all relatively easier things to learn. If we can get through dental school, learning printing and milling is really not that hard. It's just, uh, just need to sit down and just do it a little. Designing is something that does take time to learn. There is definitely a learning curve with designing, but again, it's nothing impossible. Anyone can learn designing. Oh, questions. So let's kind of open it up. Are people still here? People, uh, listening people uh like like what we had to say didn't like what we had to say let us know uh yeah so we have a few questions in the chat so i'm going to read them to you and then um you can answer them as we go um so if anybody has any questions you can still put them in the chat we're just going to go from the top um uh the first question is what dat study material did you find most helpful so i would say you know there's really two big ones in the market, which everyone knows, it's DAT Bootcamp and DAT Booster. I would say, you know, Booster is a little bit more similar to the real DAT and Bootcamp's a little bit more difficult than the real DAT. Either one of those is going to be good. Um, it's really just, you know, preference. I think Booster is a little bit cheaper, but yeah, either one of those, you know, you're going to get your 10 practice exams and um, you, you'll, you'll be able to prepare accordingly. And then what was the second question? Um, what are some things that can help me stand out in my dental school application? So one thing I like to tell people is, in general, the two biggest metrics that admissions look for is your GPA and it's your DAT, right? If any of those metrics are like subpar or below average, um, 
they kind of just like push your application to the side, right? It's funny. I talked to Brian Hahn maybe a month ago. He's the he's one of the uh, admissions, you know, I don't know if he's ahead, but he's one of the admissions people at Penn. And that's literally what he told me. Like Penn is an Ivy League school. Um, so they're, they want 3738 GPAs, 22, 23 DATs. If you don't have that, shuck your application. That's Penn, right? Um, not every school is wants those metrics. But in general, keep that in mind. Everything else is icing on the cake. Nobody cares if, you know, you were president of this, that, and this, and you have a 2.5 GPA and an 18 that, right? So think about that, um, you know, as you get, go through school, prioritize your GPA because that's the four-year sort of standard they're looking at. And your DAT, you really only need three months. Just put your head down 10 hours a day, grind it through, get your 21, and, and move on. Wait, I have a question, Neil. Um sure. Can you take like easy science classes to boost your GPA? Um, Cause that will count towards your science GPA if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, you can like, I mean, if you're a bio major, you're gonna have to take, you know, your your core bio classes and, and some gen eds, I'd say, you know, ultimately I think what people really screw up is their freshman year. I think people get into college, they have the freedom, they don't know what to do with it. They end up partying too much or, you know, trying to hit on chicks too much, their GPA goes in the tank and they spend the whole, you know, the latter half of their college career just trying to get out of the of that hole. So um start strong, finish strong. And yeah, take take sciences. I, another thing that I always did is rate my professor.com. Make sure your professor is like, you know, not an a-hole and just gonna like fail everybody and be really, really hard. <laughs> You know, make sure that people are, you know, they'll tell you literally, they'll tell you on that website, yeah, this professor was awesome, he was fair, versus this professor was awful, avoid this class altogether. So that's probably what I would do, you know, in general, when when choosing classes. Yeah, I've used Ray, my professor, and that thing has, saves lives. So like, people will tell you like, oh, don't do this, don't do that, oh, don't do, you know what, think smarter, not harder. Why do you want to take a harder class with a harder professor? And, and potentially get a C. Why not just take the easier class? If your goal is to get into dental school and these and these comp, and these schools are looking at you cutthroat, 3.7, 3.8 or not, why are you taking any chance possible of not taking the easiest class? Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. People tell you like, oh, you have to do this and be studious and blah, blah, blah. Why? Do the easiest. I'm not saying, I'm not saying cut corners, but I'm saying if you have the ability to pick classes that are easier with better professors that, you know, it's just the reality and people don't tell you that. So, you know, don't make your life harder, make it easier, go enjoy college, but at the same time, be focused. You know, you have to, you, you have to know when it's time to study and when it's time to go out and have fun with your friends. There's a big difference. And there's mm -hmm. some weekends I spent 5 a.m. in the library. There's some weekends I was up partying 5 a.m. So you have to know your balance and you have to know when to pick and choose, but you can have it all. Um, but be smarter about it. That's it. Okay. Um, the next question is, how did you pay for dental school? Did you take a line of credit and how long did it take to pay off? Go ahead, Dark. You got this one. So, yeah. So um, for dental school, yes. I So technically you can get federal student loans, which is, you know, how most people are paying colleges. Some people will... Um, it's called the direct loans, I believe. There's like graduate loans. And so with these loans, they're about like six, 7% um, each loan per semester, maybe like, I want to say like 40,000 maybe. And so, no, we didn't, I did not pay them my student loans back. Student loans are over a period of time. So like maybe 10, 25 years, um, we, because of COVID, things have been pushed back um, without the without the accruing interest, which was nice. So, but now that student loans are actually about to resume, um, yes, I'm. I literally this morning spent all my morning looking into student loans and how I want to plan to attack it. Uh, but you know what? If you if you have a, a good, um, you know, you have a good um, good job, which you will in dentistry then student loans aren't that bad. 
Um, there are different ways to strategize how to how you want to pay back your student loans. Yes, dentistry has one of the highest student loans out of all the professions, I'm sure. Um, but you know what? When you're when you're when you're doing uh, you know high level procedures and producing at a good level and you know working, uh, you know making you know pretty decent salary as a dentist. Yes, you know these loans aren't too bad. You're not gonna like not be able to go out and do anything. Um, but you definitely want to. I, I hired a com I hired a consultant, a coach actually. It's called Fitbucks.com. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. F I T B U X. But they basically help you consult on student loans. It's like eighteen dollars a month or something, and so you get to call them anytime. Um, but yeah, they they help me strategize along around my loans, and there's different ways you can do it. Uh, there's like the income driven, the uh, the standard, and whatever. But at the end of the day, the point being is that there's a strategy for it. Um, right now, my student loans it could range anywhere from fifteen hundred a month to three thousand a month payments. It just all depends on what your strategy is. Um, and uh, and yeah, I hope that answered it. Uh, the next question is, how did you hear about these continuing implant education opportunities and decide the investment was worth the risk? And then um, additional question to that is, what personal factors influenced you to make that investment? Uh, I'll let Neil answer. I just want to say one thing real quick is investing in yourself. That's the best investment you can make. So anyone who tells you otherwise, they don't know what they're talking about. You invest in yourself. You're the best investment you're going to ever make. And and you yourself will see the value in it over time. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, 100%. I couldn't agree more. A lot of the money that I made, obviously, went back into myself early in my career. And I think that's the key word, early. Do it when you graduate. Yeah, these courses are not cheap. But, you know, you have to think if each implant that you place is $3,000, you're getting, you know, 30 to 35 percent of that. It adds up over time and the higher level stuff you can do, the more money you make. So. You know, when I look back at my career, which is pretty, it's only been two years since 2021, I feel like I've been here longer, but um, the best best decisions I ever made was investing a shit ton of money into this game because now it's paying me back five, 10 X. Um, that's better than, you know, your average return. So I'm, I'm super happy about that. And as far as like finding them, this guy right here, this guy right here, Darsh was looking at implant forces junior year. I, I was trying to learn how to do a filling my junior year. And when you have someone like that, um, you know, pushing you to explore, you know, high level stuff when you're not ready for it, that's half the battle. Like your network is half the battle. Find friends that are that are doing things that, you know, ultimately you really should be doing as a general dentist. If you want to make money, I'll just tell you guys, as I'm sure everybody wants to make money here, um, you have to be able to do things that, you know, I, I tell general dentists now who are, who are coming out, a root canal or an implant, you got to get good at one of those too, at least, right? Everybody can do a filling. Fillings don't really pay a lot. Um, everybody can do a crown. But if you want to make a little bit more and produce a little bit more and be able to serve your patient a little bit better, learn how to do an implant, a single implant, learn how to do a crown. I mean, sorry, a root canal. Um, and I'll say as far as answering that first part of the question, you know, there's a few big ones that you can attend, you know, implant courses, implant pathway and live implant training. When you go to one course, you network so much and, and you talk to all the other attendees there. And you keep finding other courses through other people. As your network grows, you you know you, you talk with one another. Oh, I took this course; that was amazing. Oh, that course in Guatemala, one of the best I uh, you know I've taken. I highly recommend it. It snowballs, right? It just keeps snowballing. So, that's my long-winded answer to that question. Um, and just uh, another 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 to add to that, it doesn't have to be implants. Right, there's a lot of high end dollar procedures in dentistry. I think that's the key in, mm -hmm. in, in dentistry is you can just do fillings and cleanings and whatever all day long. But at, at the end, th there is a place for that. There, there is a place for that. There are places that will pay you good money for that. Mm -hmm. But 
um, you know, is it really satisfying? Are you really changing lives? Are you really doing something that is fun and thrilling and there's a learning experience to it? I don't know. Um, but, you know, you can do Invisalign, ortho, braces. You can do, uh, you know, peds if you're interested. You don't have to do a peds residency to work with kids. You can do, uh, uh, there's a pediatric offices that will hire general practitioners. You can do, what else is there? Veneers, obviously veneers, uh, veneers and crowns. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, the higher up you go, you'll see, you know, it starts all to connect like all the disciplines and, you know, there's multidisciplinary approach and, you know, all these different things, but you don't necessarily need to be the jack of all trades is my advice. You just pick what you like and focus on that. And, and, and you will become really good at that. And then, you know, other doors will start to open up, but you know, no one's, no one's, no one graduates normal school and they're placing implants, doing full mouth crowns and doing Invisalign and ortho. Like if they do, please send them my way. I want to, I want to learn from them. But, um, <clears throat> but in terms of, in terms of just finding your kind of niche, find your niche, get good at it. And then you pivot, you know, you can pivot from there and learn other things. Um, the next question is, what is your best advice to get into dental school? I feel like I, I answered that. Um, I, I have a long winded video on my YouTube, same handle at uh, Dr. Neil official. And I think the title is literally like how to get in dental school. So check that out if you want a long-winded answer. But like I said before, GPA, DAT are the main metrics. Everything else is icing on the cake. So as far as extracurriculars, find certain you know clubs that you want to be a part of and then get leadership positions within them. That might take two, three years. So that means you have to stay in the club for a couple of years, work your way up, find the leadership position. Because dental schools want to know that, you know, you can lead, you can be a team, you can communicate these basic things. Um, and, you know, shadow, obviously, I don't, you know, shadowing is, is important, but I wouldn't like go out of your way to get like a billion hours. You know, if you shadow five days of eight hours or, you know, six, seven days, get your 50 to 100 hours in, I'd say. Um, but, you know, have leadership positions, have your core metrics, your GPA and your DAT. Where they need who, to be. who wrote who, on their DAT application? If you had nine, if you had like eighty-five hours, who wrote a hundred? Everybody, everybody. Yeah. So uh, you know, it's it's all right. But but yeah, definitely do go out and shadow. Um, I I think I think shadowing helped me a lot. Like this is so. This is one thing that I did personally. I went to local dentists in my area during summer, and I was like, hey man, can I like intern at your office for like six for like four weeks or like six weeks or whatever they would give me i'll i'll come here every day 8 a.m in the morning when the office opens and stay until you know when you leave and i did that at like one office in particular and it was a perio prost one guy another guy was a gp both very nice guys and 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 i just got to see them every day in and out what they're doing you know all the all the procedures they're doing, how they run their staff, how they run their office. Go, they had multiple offices, so I would go to their other offices as well. And I just got to follow these guys around for a whole month. And and you know, even though you know it's whatever, um, it's not like really that big on the um, application necessarily. But for myself, you know, it really gave me an understanding about what I what I want to do about dentistry, how I like it, what I don't like, um, what other people are doing. And I feel like that experience just really overall shaped me um, for, you know, dentistry uh, and, and, you know, and what you can offer in return is say, hey, um, I will do things that your office doesn't, that needs done that people aren't doing. Like, I don't know, like making gift bags or, oh, like uh, cleaning up this or like, uh, I don't know, like pouring stone models or whatever it is. There's a million things in an office that, that, that they don't have time to do every day. So if you can be willing to do those things and in return, just follow them around all day, I think that is a great experience in itself. And it gave me so many things to talk about during my interview because I was around those people every day, learning all those terminologies and, and being in the trenches and asking them what a tr instrument this is and how they, how they use the autoclave and, and I don't know, just random things. 
and and you know that gave me so many different things to talk about during my interview um i definitely i'm uh say that that's a good thing to do um more with shadowing uh this question is should we shadow more general dentists or in your opinion do you think shadowing specialties would be worth it i think you should do you know whoever you can shadow you should shadow because it's going to give you insight on what you like and what you don't like before you even know anything about dentistry right so a lot of times people go in with the idea of oh i want to be an orthodontist that's that's that was me i was like i thought i wanted to be an orthodontist before dental school and then i got into dental school i'm like i wouldn't I, I definitely don't want to be an orthodontist you know um because you just don't really know you don't know what you don't know so go shadow like i shadowed a pedodontist i shadowed an oral surgeon i shadowed a general dentist just to get my feet wet and just see what these people were doing and then when I got to dental school, when you actually get to, you know, do these procedures, you're going to figure out what you like by and large. Right. And from then on, um, you'll know. So, yeah, I would shout out everybody. Um, next question is for the D4s in here. I know you had your different approaches to get into implant dentistry, but when looking for jobs and even when getting the job out of school, how do you convince the dentist to let you place your first implant or work on implant cases? So I have a good answer to this. Number one, find a mentor that actually does the procedure you want to do. If you find a mentor that places implants, chances are, you know, my, my first job, I had a mentor that placed implants. And for my first implant, he was right there. So it was nice, right? But of course, before he let me place implants, I took you know, I took two different courses just to get my feet wet. And then every course I placed 20 to 30 implants. So that's also important. You want to have some base level of knowledge um, and some clinical skill set before, you know, anyone's going to let you do anything, right? So you invest on, on the back end and then on the front end, you find a mentor that, you know, will, will mentor you through that process. And my first job, my mentor did it. He placed implants and did not let me place implants. He didn't trust me to place implants. And in that situation, what do you do? You can tell the guy like, oh, you own the practice, but I'm going to do what I want anyway. No. So I, you know, I just, um, I just, you know, I still, I still learned a lot from him um, as a mentor. He was a, still a really good mentor, but, uh, but I just ended up uh, we ended up moving on and I ended up finding a, finding a job where I could place implants. So just because someone says no to you and that's not what you want, it's okay to leave. You know, that's an option. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to be stuck with that. As an associate, you can get a job anywhere. There is no, there is no city in the United States of America that, that there isn't an associate job opening for. You can move anywhere and you'll find a job. So just because someone doesn't agree with you um, ideally, it would be great to find all that out up front, but yeah. in case that doesn't happen, it's okay. You just you can find a new job. You can just disagree to disagree. That's a good point. Talk to your future employer up front. I really want to do this. How, how you know? What do I have to do to be able to place implants in your practice? What are your criteria? And they may tell you straight up. You know, you can place an implant as long as you know I'm over your shoulder. Or I want you to take, you know, at least one course, which I'm affiliated with first. Like, so talk to your future boss in, you know, six years when you guys get there and um, go from there, I would say. And if they don't want to let you place implants, then I'm running the other way. It's a waste of my time. Because why are you not wanting me to get better and make more money for you and place implants? Because they're also benefiting too if I'm placing implants, right? They're also making money off of me. Um, more of their patients are getting treated. I'm doing more work. I'm getting more fulfilled. So why wouldn't you let me place implants? So let's talk about that for a minute. That's how I would come at it. But look, you haven't placed any implants. You don't know what you're doing. So exactly. just come out with the humility and just be like, hey, um, you know, what can I do to get there? That's how I'd frame it. I wouldn't frame it as oh, I'm the shit. I took implant pathways. Now let me go. Let's rip some metal. No yeah. one's going to hire you. Get educated first, guy. Go learn. There's yeah. so many textbooks that, you know, we've all read. Me and Doris, we're reading textbooks every day now. I never thought I'd open a textbook after that. <laughs> Here I am spending my free time like a nerd and reading these textbooks. But honestly, 
th that's what you do, you know, in this, when you graduate and you want to learn, you take courses, you read textbooks, you have to be educated. You have to be, you know, one of the smartest people in the room when you're dealing with the best in the world, right? They ask you a question, you can't be a dumbass and not know what you're doing. So you gotta, you gotta be ready for it. It's uh, funny, I never read a textbook in dental school. Now here I am. <laughs> yeah. No, but you don't have time to read textbooks in dental school, but yeah. um, what's the next question? Um, do you think taking a gap year is beneficial even if you have everything ready for your application? I'm considering a gap year to avoid feeling so rushed. So um, I took a gap year, but you start and then I'll, I'll answer. So, so I did the three plus four. Um, you know, I skipped a year of undergrad and got into dental school. I was 21. I graduated and I was 24. Right now, if I look at how many 20, I'm 27 now, how many 27 year olds that are doing all on next and doing these specialty procedures and, and this ahead in their career, I saved a whole year of undergrad. Like uh, it's, it's invaluable. Now I can take a gap. If I wanted to, I'd rather take a gap year today than, than, than six years ago. Because to me, you know, this is just my opinion. Everyone's different. But to me, it doesn't make any sense to take a gap year because you're delaying your growth in a way. Because you're going to, your growth is going to be like, like this. Your growth is going to be like this when you're, it's going to be exponential when you're in, when you're in dental school and right outside of dental school, right? When you graduate. So you want to get to that period as fast as possible. Then from there, then you have options. Then you can work part-time. Then you can go explore the world. Now you have money to do what you want to do. But if you delay that growth and, and you come out, you know, 20, uh, like late 20s, 30s, even 40s, you know, kids, marriage, you know, all these things. I was able to luckily do it before then. But again, everyone's situation is different. You know, I can't speak to speak to that. You know, maybe you have a child, maybe you, you know, getting married, whatever it is. But what I'm saying is that if you can try to get it done earlier, then go take a gap. That's my advice. So I, I delayed my, um, I took a gap here. So I'm, I'm a loser recording in Darsh, but no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you are not. <laughs> no, so I mean, listen, it depends on your situation. I wasn't ready. I didn't have my DAT done. I took it twice. Um, I wasn't like, like I said, I wasn't someone like whiz kid and, you know, just 4.0, 23 DAT. It wasn't me. So I had no choice. Now, if you're, if you're ready to go and, and all your, you said everything's ready in your application, you know, I would love to know why you want to take a gap year. Um, I don't know if you want to turn your mic, but if it's, you know, you want to break, and you need a break and, you know, you have stuff going on by all means, right. You want to be able, cause once you get into dental school, that's it. You have four years, you're grinding, right. You're, you're, you're pushing for four years. Um, like Dar said, I mean, if you can, and you're able to just go, I would just go straight if you can, but you know, like I said, it's a unique situation for everyone. It's very hard to answer. Yeah. That's a very personal question. Yeah. So I'm sorry if my answer offended anyone. Um, but as you can tell, you know, me and Neil have, yeah, I hope you're offended, Neil. Uh, me and Neil, we have very approaches to kind of how we got here, but we still got here. You know, that's the thing. It doesn't yeah. matter how you get there. You just get there. And, and it doesn't matter if you took a gap year. It doesn't matter if you got a bad DAT score. It doesn't matter if your grades were crappy. It doesn't matter if you failed your, you know, dental board exam, whatever it is. You, I failed one, a part of the dental board exam. Okay, so what? Um, so I just retook it. And we move on with life. So failure is going to happen. Um, but just keep moving along, keep chugging, associate yourself with the right people, and you will get there. What are your thoughts on fully guided implant surgery versus freehand? So I will say that when you're first starting out, you want to avoid guides altogether. You don't want to get pigeonhole yourself into only using a guide because one day that guide's not going to fit. And when that guy doesn't fit and you can't do a freehand implant, what are you going to do? You know what I'm saying? So your first 50 cases, you know, and obviously, uh, I don't know if you're in dental school now, but your first 50 cases of implant, you should lay a flap, which means you should see the bone. You should physically be able to see your bones. You cut through the tissue, you reflect the tissue, you look at the bone and you place the implant, right? 
you do that. And I actually have never used a guide to this day, right? So once you understand your anatomy and once you understand how to work your angles a little bit, you don't really need a guide. Sure, it can speed you up a little bit. And maybe I will use guides to an extent in Seattle. Um, don't learn on it. That's my opinion. Yeah, I'm doing my first guided case, my first guided case after doing hundreds of implants. So mm. I'm doing it, uh, the, I'm doing it on like a, on a number 19. So lower molar, you know, easy bone and an easy case slam dunk. I could do this in my sleep, but I wanted to do it on a case that's easy that if I, do, if I just need to throw the guide, I can just throw it. Um, yeah. And so the one place where I will find to say, I think I find value in guides is anterior cases because anterior cases are very hard to uh, front cases. So your front six teeth, you have to get the implant placement perfect. The tissue has to follow perfect. The everything has to be perfect because imagine one of us, we're missing a front tooth and now the implant angle is off. You're going to be pissed, right? You're going to be pissed at me. And you're going to be pissed for the rest of your life, you know? Mm -hmm. So that has to be perfect. So in that case, yes, a guide makes sense to do it. I'm learning guided to do single anterior implant cases. Um, but, you know, that's after I've done uh, like hundreds of implants, like I said. So I have a couple of questions in my direct chat, but um, do you have any insight on international students studying in the U.S. who want to apply to dental schools? Is it harder for domestic students, students and are there any differences? Um, repeat that for, so, it, so repeat that one more time for me. Uh, do you have any insight on international students, um, studying in the U S who want to apply to dental schools and is it harder than domestic students? So, I mean, look, we're not international students, so it's very hard to answer. Is it more difficult or not? But from the friends that I had who were international students, um, they obviously completed dental school in their respective country, came here. At Temple, at least, it was, you know, a two-year program, and they got to skip, you know, the didactics by and large. They did their two years, and then, then they were off. So from the students that I talked to, they seemed very happy. Um, obviously, nobody wants to do dental school twice. You have no choice. If you want to practice here, that's what you have to do. Um, as far as I know that each school will probably have a quota for how many international students, you know, they can bring on and how many um, domestic students, obviously, they can bring on. So, um, but that's, that's you know, the extent of, of what I know about that. Wait, so um, <laughs> the only thing is, is this person an international dentist? Are you assuming international dentist or international college student? I think international college student. Oh, okay. International yeah. College. So then in that case, I'm... I don't know the answer to it, but I think you get pulled with the regular set of students in terms of like, let's say it's a class of 150 and 15 are international dentists. The other 135, I think you get pulled into that section of just the regular students, not international dentists. Mm. Um, now, I, I can't answer if it's if it's easier or not, um, but I think you do have the same fighting chance from what I would just guess. Yeah. Um, the next one is: Is it worth? Uh, is it worth it to take a biochemistry or physics class before taking the debt? Um, no, you don't need it. You're basically your 200 level bios is what you need. Your 200 level bios, your gen chem, <clears throat> your ochem, your reading, your basic math. That's really it. Perception. Yeah, no, no biochem on there. No, um, what was the other subject you said? Uh, uh, physics. Physics. No, no physics on there. Well, thank God, Neil, you're here. I, I don't know the answer to any of these questions. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, the next one is, is it necessary to work as a dental assistant during undergrad? What can we do if this isn't possible for us? I don't think it's necessary. I mean, I'm sure if you do it, power to you. Um, You'll, you'll have a much easier time in dental school, especially. Um, and perhaps you, you know, you have an easier time getting in, but I, I didn't know anything 
about what dentists did prior to dental school. Like I really didn't have a lot of knowledge there. I didn't have family who was in dental. Like I kind of just shadowed. And when you shadow, you can like barely see anything. So I would just like watch and I didn't know what I was looking at. That was my experience. So um, Darish was out here like shadowing Perio Pross. I wasn't doing that. Um, you know, my parents are doctors and I'm like, I don't want to do that. So let me just go to dental school. I, I didn't really like have a well thought out plan back in the day. It's crazy how your life kind of goes. You know, if I would have looked back in my life, I, it's crazy to think I'm here based on where I started. But, you know, that's life, I guess. You never know what's coming. So, um, no, I was just going to say in terms of assisting, I know there's a lot of people that recommend assisting and it is amazing, um, amazing experience. But like I said, um, you could also come out with the angle of being like a month, like few weeks intern. I feel like that's also a nice way of not having to, and you're not paid for it either. Um, that's also a nice way of just being in there for a few weeks, you know, really learning the ins and outs. I didn't have to assist. And quite frankly, assisting is tough. You know, it's not easy. You really have to know how to work with the doctor and the office and all this and all that. And you have to clean. And yeah, yeah. I mean, if that's what you really want to do, do it. But it's not necessary. You know, you don't need to do that. If you have a year off, though, do it. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you have a year looking, off. Back, looking back, I mean, I, I could have easily done that. I didn't. But, you know, it definitely would have been beneficial for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions, guys? Please. Uh, yeah, there's two more, and then we can wrap if nobody else has any questions. But uh, this one is: How do you make connections with the dentist you're shadowing enough to request a letter of recommendation? The dentist I'm shadowing is a really nice person, and I'm learning a lot, but I don't feel like she knows me well enough. So, so go ahead, Neil. I would say, you know, build a relationship just like you would with anybody else, right? You build a relationship first, then you ask second. So um, I would continue if she if she'll have you continue to shadow her as much as you can. And then, you know, when you when you think you have a good relationship and, and this dentist, you know, likes you and, and likes your, you know, your company, then you ask. That's what I would do. That's what I did personally. I would never just ask after, you know, 20 minutes of meeting somebody, obviously, but yeah. No, I'm good. So the two guys that I work with, um, you know, I, I like came in every day, like kind of like a student and you, you have to sit down with them and talk to them. You can't just be like, Oh, I'm in your office. I'm, I'm getting my hours. Like oh, one, two, three, four, you're counting the hours. Like, no, you have to be in there talking with them, asking about them, about their lives. You know, they're people too. Yes, they're doctor, this and that, blah, blah, blah. But they're people too, asking about their lives, asking about their kids, their family, you know? How is someone going to know you if you never talk to them? How is someone going to know you if you never open up to them? So, you know, just be, and people love talking about themselves. Everyone loves talking about themselves and bragging and doing all this. And I did that. But when you can, when you can just question them and, you know, get them to open up, you know, boom, they, they, you know, dentist, dentist, you know, it can be lonely in the office when you're the only dentist yourself. So when, you know, when you can come at it from that perspective, like, you know, I'm your friend too, but uh, you know, you're my mentor, um, you know, it builds a good relationship. My guys, they invited me to their Christmas party. You know, they, um, I sent them cookies, you know, you have to do these little things like, you know, bring her, bring her a box of chocolate on Monday. Be like, Hey, I was thinking about you. Here you go. You know, like, just do little things that don't cost any money. You didn't, it doesn't need to be some like end of all arrangements or like taking them to like some concert ticket or I don't know, like Taylor Swift, but uh, just give them a small little something and that's it. You know, it's really interesting. Darsha said that. I read a book, I don't know, a couple of years ago on technology. And one of the things the book talked about was if you give a gift to somebody, psychologically, they, 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 they think they need to return the favor. So it's a great idea. Go get a fruit basket and be like, yo, actually, I did that. Um, so when I was shadowing Simon a few years ago, I got him a bottle of his favorite tequila or something. I found out what it was. I got it just as a thank you, you know, so do that. It's a good uh, little hack. I literally thought about that and I forgot about it. When you give, it's called reciprocity. When there you it give is. someone something. Yeah. When you give someone something, they're more likely to give something back. When you go to a restaurant, 
and the waiter gives you one mint, maybe you might tip 15, 18%. But when that waiter gives you five mints, you're like, God dang, this guy just gave me five mints. All right, I have to give him 25% now. So mm -hmm. it's just, we all think psychologically like that. Read this book. I don't know. What is it? Six Influences or what is it called? But mm -hmm. just look it up. Influences. I think it's Art of Persuasion by... Art of it. Persuasion, yes. Or yeah. Cialdini or whatever. Yeah, yeah, Cialdini. yeah, yeah that's it. Okay, the next question is, do you think applying in September for American dental schools is too late? No. I think you should apply. You know, it's funny. I took my DAT in the summer. I needed to retake it. I waited till after, like, December when everybody got their admission and I didn't. I ended up taking my DAT, like, in January, like, the, the same cycle, guys. So... Was that ideal? Absolutely not. But it was like, either I try or I don't try. And I ended up getting in very late in the cycle. So it's possible. Is it ideal? Absolutely not. It's a rolling admission, apply as early as possible. But um, I know schools, you know, will start to review apps in September. So yeah, you might be a little bit um, on the latter end of the rolling, but there's two acceptances, right? There's a December acceptance. And then there's like a March, April-ish acceptance. I, I got in that second tier of acceptances. So um, I would still apply. Yeah, I know it's money, but if you have the GPA, you have the DAT, you have a strong application, I would say you do it. And my take on it is like, this is just me again. You know, you don't take the gas off the pedal. I applied within the first two weeks of when that application opened up. I got in first, first, uh, first possible date. So like the point I'm trying to make is that yes things happen life happens you know it might not always be ideal but if you can do everything you can to set yourself up for success from the beginning why wouldn't you do it doesn't make it doesn't i don't see why you wouldn't and uh and and it's just one of those things where this is not one of those times to lay off the gas this is the time to go all in get it done get it done right because once you're in then you can chill then you can do whatever you want but until you get in, just, you know, keep your head up and just keep going. It's interesting. Darsh is type A. I'm not. Darsh did everything yeah. the right way. I kind of like didn't do everything the right way, but we're still in the same position. <laughs> we're still there doing the same thing. So it really doesn't matter how you get here. Just get here, you know, one way or get another. Here. You know, that's funny how, how that is. But any other last minute questions? Guys? Yeah, we have a couple more actually. Um. What advice would you give for someone coming out of dental school with decent surgery experience? Should I look for a purely surgical position or is that unrealistic? It's funny. Um, somebody, yeah. somebody DM me about this this earlier this summer. I forget his name. He said he went to, I think it was West Virginia University and had 500 extractions in his third year or some obscene number. And what I told him was, your best bet is to um, either work for, you know, a company that only does that, like me and Darsh did. We work for a dentures and implant clinic that only pretty much does that. And ideally you have a mentor. So I told him, go, go find a practice that's producing anywhere from three to $5 million a year. That means they're in need of an associate, right? If you're producing that much, the doctor is going to be burned out. He wants somebody to help him. So he ended up doing that and he actually got a position at that office. And it's like a $5 million a year office, super high volume. Um, the doctor can do everything. He's going to be a great mentor. So, you know, if surgery is what you really want to do, just understand you're pigeonholing yourself, right? I can no longer go back to general dentistry. I can't do it. I'm on the other spectrum, but I want to be on that spectrum, right? So do I think it was, it was, you know, I did general dentistry for four months in, in that office that I, you know, after I graduated. Um, did I think there was value in it? I do. But if I, you know, if I were to do it again, um, I don't know what I'd do. What do you think, Darcy? Did you go straight? Or would you do your six months of general dentistry, learn how to talk to patients, learn how to treatment plan, basic things, and then go? Because that's a little bit more high stakes dentistry, you know? Yeah. You know why that's that's a that's a tough answer. So you can, you know, in that case, 
if you're already doing a six month, like, uh, like you said, six month of just an associateship, there's nothing wrong with doing a one, one year GPR EGD. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's yeah. number one. Number two, yeah, you, you need to get comfortable with patients, you know, and, and if yeah. you don't, if you're not comfortable talking to a patient, you know, just, just being in an office for me, I'm just going to be honest, working with 10 women at once was a life-changing experience. I just didn't know how to communicate with them. And I had to learn very quickly how to deal with 10 women at once because office manager saying this, DA saying that, lab tech saying this, you know, this person saying that, and I it's just chaos. And, and for me, I needed to, you know, kind of go through the trenches and have some of the offices not like me. As a dentist, some of my early offices, they did not like me. You know, I just didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to stay on top of the schedule. I didn't know how to, you know, um, uh, be efficient. And they're used to doctors who are like, you know, moving, doing, talking, you know, whatever. And, and you know, as a new grad, you know, you can sense that fresh blood, you know, they can sense it, they know. But but if you can if you can find somewhere just to kind of get your feet wet a little bit, I think that would be great. But it's not necessary. It's definitely not necessary. Um, if if I had if I had gone into the den, if I had gone into the surgery game from the beginning, looking back, I would have been fine. But that's not to say that everyone would be fine. Um, you know, not everyone is jumping in doing some crazy procedure day one. Everyone's probably doing a cleaning. And then they post a picture of someone else's x-ray that, hey, this is, no, I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> uh, what I would say is, uh, is, yeah, just there is definitely a learning curve the first three to six months to just getting used to um, what, uh, what dentistry is all about. So it's okay if you need to uh, how to take that. Um, we have a couple more, sorry. Um, what was your biggest misconception about dental school and what challenge did you, what challenge did you not expect once you started your dental program? Um, it's funny looking back at dental school, my biggest, mis the biggest misconception that I've sort of felt looking back, right. Was everybody was, and maybe this isn't the best advice to give, but I'll, I'm gonna keep it real. Um, everybody was freaking out about their grades everybody was you know like oh my god like you know i need to get an a i need to get an a it just doesn't matter like that much like especially if you're going to be a general dentist right um i don't think any job that i've ever had asked for my like transcript like it's just not a thing they want to know that you can do this you can talk you can communicate you're a likable person being a likable person is in life is going to get you farther than what you got on your biochem exam like that's just reality. So, you know, and if you want, listen, if you want to specialize and you want to go in OS, yes, you need to bust your ass. You need to get your, your grades, any, any specialty really, uh, maybe not pedo, but like perio OS, um, ortho, you need to like have a high GPA for me. I knew from day one after ortho was out of the equation, I want to be general. I want to go work right away. So, you know, I, I worked hard. I got by, you know, I, I wasn't like top of my class or anything like that. I'll tell you that. Um, but that was probably the biggest misconception that, that I found in dental school. Um, go ahead, Dar. Um, I would say like, you, I would say for me, dental school was a very transformative period as a person. I came in as a 21 year old, you know, who was still trying to party. And that, and even, you know, there were people with like married and kids and like, you know, a whole different family. And I'm just like, what? So there is going to be a wide range of people in dentistry and you're going to meet different backgrounds and different personalities. And, and so, you know, finding yourself in it is very important as like cheesy as that sounds like I changed so much from day one of dental school to the end of dental school. And, and that is part of the journey everyone's, I think, in a different, different uh, place coming in. But then you kind of see you all kind of get together and, and, you know, you all are on the same level, you're still the same student. Um, uh, but, you know, as a, as on a personal level, you know, I just learned so much about myself in, in my early 20s in dental school. And so that's definitely an aspect of life that you don't want to uh, ignore. 
Um, you know, you still need to grow in dental school as a person, just because you're in dental school doesn't mean your life stops or your family goes away, or your friends go away. You, that's still important things that you need to, you know, uh, build on. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I'll add one, one quick thing, guys. Focus on when you're in dental school, when you get in, you know, obviously, yeah, you're going to have your two years of academic, your, your latter two years are the important years, right? What you do clinically, what you learn clinically, you know, for me, I lived in the oral surgery clinic. You know, I was there almost every day. Uh, I bribed the front desk lady to call me, you know, when, and anytime I had a patient and she did. So find the loopholes and get good with people and get good with your patients. That's what's actually going to matter when, when you graduate. People, people, people. That's right. Um, All right. If, or if so, best have time. Yeah. Yeah, that's what um, I was going to say. That's yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. That's we'll fine. Okay. Um, do you think research during your undergrad is necessary? I didn't do it. No. Yeah. But the one hurts you. Man, we'll do one more. We'll do one, we'll do one more. That was a quick one. We'll do one yeah. more. Okay. Let's do rapid fire. Let's do rapid fire. <laughs> what are some activities we can do to improve our manual dexterity? Anything uh, that involves your hands. Cooking, knitting uh just uh being under Maybe. pressure you know uh just one last just, question yeah. um uh, that's for me so i know dr Belodia, you did the three plus four program from temple did you feel like you missed out on your college experience not having that you know fourth year okay what did people do their fourth year i had the best year of my life party party, the party. go go out with neil that's what they did their fourth year Okay, I got into dental school. I was 21. I still got to go out with my friends. I still got to go to all the events, have fun. Uh, it's just a, uh, it's just a, uh, you just get, you don't want FOMO to be the reason to holding you back. That is the worst possible idea, in my opinion. You need to, you know, this is just me, but you want to progress as fast as you can and as efficiently as you can, you know, within your limits. And, and, you know, missing my fourth year of college. Literally, I missed nothing. People were just sitting there partying, hanging out, you know, not caring about school, senior year, whatever. Okay, I had to work. Fine. But guess what? It's paying dividends now because I can go travel wherever I want, whatever I want, because I'm done earlier at an earlier age and it's paying dividends. Thank I'll, you. Never, I'll never, I'll never uh, take, take away my senior year, by the way, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah. If you guys want to go have your senior year, go hang out, Neil. That's right. Yeah, it, was, it was really fun, guys. I'm really happy we were able to do this. And I hope you guys, you know, learn some stuff. DM me or Darsh anytime. If I don't yes. respond, just DM Please me again. pull your phone out and follow us. If you like us, pull your phone out and your, follow us. Yeah, go back to that. Uh, your slide, yeah. That way they can see your Instagram handle. Um, I, well, I'll take this time to thank both Dr. Belodia and Dr. Chowdhury for um, coming on Dental Shadowers to have this session. I know a lot of people uh, really enjoyed the session with your insights um, about your dental school journey and along with what you do. Um, those are their Instagram handles if you wanna go give them a follow. Um, we do have some sessions coming up in the next week. So if you guys wanna continue to join us, uh, that'd be great. But thank you for um, coming out to everyone. Thank you. you got it. Have a good yeah. night, guys. Have a good night. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah.